Welcome Chicago, I'm happy to be in Chicago. But I am a little sad to learn that I'm not having enough sex or thinking about sex enough. Um, I'm also sad to learn that I'm not organized, that I can't remember anything. So do you all feel like me? Yeah, I'm telling you. Um, maybe this will help. Uh, maybe some of you all remember back in the 80s when, um, we ha when it was more simple, all we had to do is have an egg and a frying pan, and we kind of knew what was happening. <laughs> Video. <laughs> is there anyone out there who still isn't clear about what doing drugs does? OK, last time. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? <laughs> so I should tell you, those kind of advertisements, all those public service announcements actually encouraged me or made me want to learn about the brain and what drugs actually do to the brain. See, I grew up in a neighborhood in which we were all told that drugs were the major reason that the community were having so much problems, or so many problems. And so I thought it'd be interesting to go and get a PhD in neuroscience and learn what drugs do on the brain. <laughs> and so what I'd like to do today is just briefly treat you all like you're in my classroom, just for just a little bit. I don't mean to insult you, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So if you focus your attention on the slide here, this is a picture of a neuron. And this is a dopamine neuron. It contains this neurotransmitter called dopamine. Neurotransmitters is how the brain or the cells communicate with each other in order for us to uh, accomplish behavioral acts, to have thoughts, and so forth. And so this is just an example of a cell. And how these cells work is once the cell releases dopamine, dopamine has to be taken back up into the cell or its actions has to be terminated quite quickly in order for the body to continue to work normally. One of the things that drugs do is it kind of alters this sort of normal process. And so in altering this process, we sometimes get positive effects, but we also get negative effects. And we tend to think about drugs' effects on the brain as being negative. And sure enough, when we think about some of the data that we've collected or people have collected around the country, around the world, as it relates to drugs, I'm going to focus on methamphetamine today, but we can also extrapolate to other drugs. But methamphetamine just makes it easier for me. And today, actually, it's one of the drugs that we have vilified more often in the United States. So it's kind of sexy to focus on methamphetamine today. The, the, thing, the thing that I want to just make, the points I want to make here on this slide is it's simple. At excessively high doses, methamphetamine disrupts that process that I just described, and it produces neurotoxic effects to dopamine cells, as well as other monoamine or, or norepinephrine. You heard about adrenaline, those sorts of things. It produces toxicity to those cells. And this toxicity, after this toxicity, you can see disruptions in uh, cognitive functioning of the animal. The, these experiments are carried out in rats. This is what we know. But what we also know is that there are some caveats to those findings. Important caveats is, that, is this. You have to have excessively high doses of the drug in order to produce these neurotoxic effects that I just described. Doses that are 10, 20, 30 times the amount that humans normally take. And a second important caveat is this. If you allow the animal to become tolerant to that large effect simply by giving escalating doses of the drug over several days and then give a whopping, that whopping large dose of the drug, you no longer see the neurotoxic effects. So tolerance becomes uh, protective, if you will. So when we see these kind of findings or we have these kind of findings, the question for me, the question that I had was, well, what does it mean for humans? Does that mean that these kind of images are no longer true. Can I have the video, please? The 
This isn't normal. But on meth, it is. So the idea is this. The idea is that when you use methamphetamine or you abuse methamphetamine, it produces toxic effects to your brain such that you can't respond normally to emergency situations. So again, these, this, this raises important questions for me. Because what I know also is that methamphetamine is the same drug as amphetamine. And some of you all know, again, I'm treating you like you are my college students. Some of you all know the drug Adderall. If you were in college, you would know that drug Adderall. You all know Adderall, right? <laughs> exactly. Adderall is attention deficit disorder drug that uh, sometimes college students use in order to stay up longer and study longer. Adderall and methamphetamine are the same drug. This is a, if you focus your attention on the slide, on your left is the chemical structure of amphetamine. On your right is the chemical structure of methamphetamine. The only difference is the methyl group that's attached to methamphetamine. Some people have said that this methyl group makes methamphetamine more potent, more dangerous, more toxic, and so forth. Now, we and other people have done studies to compare the effects of amphetamine to methamphetamine in people. Several other people have done this as well. And the bottom line is, in humans, the drugs produce the same effect. And so when I see those kind of advertisements or public service announcements, I think, well, this doesn't make much sense to me. Well, and some people have said, well, yeah, okay. What about the adulterants found in street drugs, like street methamphetamine? What about the adulterants? Maybe the adulterants is the thing that is causing the neurotoxic effects or the dangerous effects where we see this kind of behavior that we saw in the public service announcement. Maybe the street adulterants. Well, that could be true. But one of the things that you all should know is that street methamphetamine is probably one of the most pure t forms of drugs on the street. Certainly, uh, when you think about something like heroin or, me or, or, or cocaine, Street methamphetamine purity is much higher than those drugs. But let's just say for argument's sake, let's just say for argument's sake, maybe it's something about uh, the adulterants in the, in the drugs, just for our argument's sake. One way you can get at this issue is to simply bring people into a lab or into a study where you compare the brains and functioning, cognitive functioning, of methamphetamine users for many years, people who have used the drug and abused the drug for many years with those people who never used the drug or never abused the drug. You can compare these folks in a study. And on the slide here is one of those type of studies. You all have seen this kind of brain imaging. This is a pet imaging study. On the left, you see the brain of a normal person, a person who has not used methamphetamine. On your right is the brain of someone who has used methamphetamine. And oftentimes what you are told is that you can clearly see the difference. And this difference is meaningful. That's what you are told. And that's what we were told, and that's what we have all been told, that this difference is meaningful. And so I believed that until I started to actually read the scientific literature carefully. And when you read the scientific literature carefully, as I have done, I decided to write a review of all the literature in this area, these brain imaging sort of uh, studies along with the cognitive findings, the thing that I found, what, actually, what we actually find is that, yeah, you do, you can see some difference in the brains of people who have abused or used methamphetamine for a number of years. You can see some differences between their brains and someone who's never used the drug. One of the most consistent findings is that you might see a 10 to 20 percent difference in some structures, maybe a 10 to 20 percent difference. The question becomes, is that difference within the normal range of human variability? Because if we take this room and image your brains, we will find differences because we have a, 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 a normal range of human variability. The question becomes, is that difference important? And one way you can get at whether or not the difference is important Look at some behavioral outcome, like cognitive functioning. 
when you look at the cognitive functioning of methamphetamine users, for example, and you compare them to controls or you compare them to people who are the same age and educational background as them, they are normal. So what it tells you about the brain differences that we've seen is that the brain differences may be within the normal range of human variability. So I don't know if the brain imaging as we do it today in drug abuse research is more advanced than the frying pan and the egg. <laughs> But what I do know is when you do behavioral studies, when you do some of the behavioral studies, one of the things that you find out, for example, methamphetamine users were said to be cognitively impaired and they couldn't uh, respond normally. We did one study in which we brought methamphetamine users into the lab. We gave them a choice between a nice dose of methamphetamine and $20. What we found is that they almost never took the drug, they took the $20. So it told us that methamphetamine users and drug users in general can and do respond rationally, even when presented with a choice to take their drug versus something else. And it also tells us or reminded us that trying to understand the behavior and the environmental factors provide a powerful tool for understanding behavior in general, understanding what people will do. So, in closing, it's clear that drugs can alter brain functioning. That's absolutely clear. But that is not even interesting. This conversation with you is altering my brain functioning. You guys have learned all kinds of things. Like Mary Lou, when she was talking about memory, you guys were learning and altering your brain. But that's not even interesting. That's why it's important for us to also look at behavior while we're looking at the brain. And that way, we will have a more rich understanding of what's going on. When we don't have a behavioral output or a behavioral measure, we may be enticed to make unwarranted speculations about the neural basis of behavior. And that's kind of what we have been doing in many, many respects. We already have these powerful technologies. We typically, get, they're, they're called behavioral sort of technologies. But they're not as sexy, and so as a result, people don't think of them when we start talking about drug effects. Instead, we talk about your brain on drugs. I want to leave you with this final point. Now, when we think about our presidents, in fact, the guy in the White House, he's from this city, right? Chicago, right? Barack Obama has used marijuana and cocaine, right? Now, that's no disrespect. He served his country well, so this is not to besmirch his reputation. Ronald Reagan has never been reported to use any drugs, right? If we image their two, if the, the brains of those two folks, do you, you think that that'll tell us something about drug users? Ronald Reagan, by the way, had Alzheimer's disease. We might see some pathology in Ronald Reagan's brain, but we probably won't see any pathology or, or changes or anything that makes us concerned in Barack Obama's brain. With that, thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>